I take you back to those days when the courts used to rule the rules. Many of you were not born. Sometime in late 1980s. I get a call from my editor. There was a massacre in Oraya, not very far from Kanpur. 21 people have been killed in a vengeful killing. Now you must be thinking which to call the Pulandevi or Malkhan Singh, but none of them. So uh, he said, Sunita, tomorrow is Oraya, your coming massacre. Without knowing anything, I was so excited. I was young in the profession. Didn't know anything about UP. It's my adopted state. I've come from Delhi. So I said, ah, to be such yeah. a fun. So and I did on page one. <laughs> wow, I don't get an opportunity. So I said, fine. I booked a cat. And right in the morning, we started our journey. Nobody could tell me where the village is. And then I said, what to do? And my driver suggested, why don't you go to the cops? So I went to the superintendent of this office. I said, today he must have kept away. He'll be there. He won't go anywhere in any meeting because today is a very, very difficult day for him, a tough situation for him. So I walked in and it was very easy to meet him because he was sitting in the veranda. His hair ruffled from his body. I could and his clothes, I could make out. He has not slept whole night. How could he? And uh, he was busy looking at some chart or something. So I said, Money, I've come from here the Sun Times and I want to go to the massacre site. Pin drop silence for some time. And then I see him looking up, teary-eyed. I said, what did you say? I said, I said I want to go to the village where the massacre took place. He said, do you know where the village is? I said, no, that's why I'm here. I have not been able to look it. He said, you should know what ravines are, jungles are in this part of the country. I said, no, I know this much. My boss has given me an assignment and I am going. This was the last thing he wanted. But perhaps he thought he saw the determination that I had. And uh, he said, okay. And after some time, I saw, he asked me, which car do you want? Do you yeah, have a vehicle in which yeah. car? I said the time tested a massacre. In those days, that massacre was the main vehicle we used to travel in. So he said, ambassador. After some day, after some time, I saw a jeep get parked there. And he said, please go in that. I said, but why? I have a car and a driver. He said, your car can't somehow go on this road. So fine. So I got into the jeep, very happy, I'm going, very excited about my adventure trip. And then I saw four cops jumping into it and with their guns. I said, maybe they're going for the their duty, he's sending them with I never thought they were going for my security. And then we started. After some time, we entered an area where there was no boat. They picked up a young guy who became our GPS. And he was also guessing this town or that town. There was not even a kitchen road. And the jeep was going this way or that way. And I could touch the ground sometimes. My excitement started disappearing. I said, Where am I going today? Page one is going to be very costly. And anyway, the guys there, the cops kept on grumbling and then one of them said, Ye to batai, don't you have men working in your office that they have sent you? I said, what women or men have to do with this? Okay, and it was a 10-15 kilometers journey and we somehow vanished and we reached that village which was the last village on the, in that area right on the banks of the river that you beautiful side. But such a foul smell, blood stains, 
embers, you could see fire still. And I saw, I have not seen blood till then. This is where I cut, where I landed myself. And I literally sobbed, if not cried. And then I saw another woman walk in, and the guy was saying, why are women here? And I saw another woman in a starched cotton sari walk in, and she was a minister. You, or some of you may be knowing, uh, Sukhda Mishra. I saw her, rushed to her, I didn't know her. Got some comfort from her. Why I talk about this? Because today I decided not to talk about myself. I've done it earlier. And there are such thrillers that I can keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on talking about it. But I don't want to. There are other important issues that I want to touch. That day, I was not sure whether I'll return home, meet my small baby or my family. They did not know how to connect to me because no phones, nothing. You had, uh, there was no way from that village you could have connected. But that day gave me one thing, more determination, confidence of my boss, and recognition. Today I stand before you. Guys, I've decided that I'll talk about the two words that have been used here, thriving and uncertainty. I want all of you, you all are young uh, students sitting here, I want all of you to go back to your school days. How many times did you prepare a timetable? Or how many times you asked your mother to help you with a study plan? Because you thought, Ki, this study plan will keep me on my toes, I'll follow it, and I'll get come 90% or 100% nowadays whatever your dream was. As, as they say, my mother used to say, if you dream, dream big, otherwise don't dream. So everybody dreams of 100%. What happened to those study tables and timetables? I think most of the time they went haywire. Ask housewives. Every day they have a schedule. And sometimes they have a menu for a week. Today I'm going to make this, tomorrow this, 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 this. And I tell you, I talk about housewives everywhere because they are the unsung heroes of a society. Nobody talks about them and their contribution. But they also make a plan. OK, there are people like me who maintain a diary. My secretary keeps a diary. He keeps on writing. You have an appointment on this day, that appointment diary. Again, most of the time, the schedule is not maintained. Why? There is nothing certain in our lives. Till the pandemic happened, we thought life is certain. We never thought death is also certain. Two things about which we don't have any uncertainty is about life and death. It's a different thing that when it will come, from where will it come, why it will come, we may have questions, we may have answers, but we don't have answers. Two things the pandemic has taught us that there is no certainty about. So what are we left with? We are left with the period between life and death. We can be the CEO of that period. How best we make use of it? How best we plan, but the controller is somewhere else. If you are an atheist, you'll say, ah, there is somebody who's doing it, or otherwise man proposes, God disposes. We have excuses for not maintaining our schedules. But there is someone, and because I'm sorry, I always say he or she, because I think God should not have a gender. So it should be both either. So he or she. They are the controllers of our lives. And when we can't even maintain our timetable as a student, school student, when a housewife can't maintain a day schedule, 
when my secretary keeps reminding me you had this appointment today and I'm not able to do it because something else important has cropped up, what else can I do? What else can we talk about? Which, which certainty can we talk about? Yes, there was a time when I thought, death, ah, only old die, young don't die. Our families never took us to any funerals because they never wanted us to see death. But I always thought a, a guy who has lost his teeth, wrinkled, can't walk, uncle ji, grand uncle ji, they die and not the young people die. But what has COVID told us? That when he decides or she decides, it comes and we go. There is no way that we can resist it. And we, all of us, I think there won't be anybody in this hall who has not been impacted mentally, physically, personally, professionally. All of us, these two years have taught us that death is real. As life is real, we celebrate life. And by the way, I remember as a child, as a child, I attended funerals which were, you know, because a 90 percent, 90 years person has died. So we used to celebrate that. I have attended funerals where people decked up and partied. So what do we do? Which sector can we talk about which actually did not suffer? We talk about media. There's so much that has happened. There's so many questions that you may happen. There are so many questions that were raised about the information that we were giving, the, the experts that were coming. We were suffering. Our media houses were suffering a huge loss. And you must be thinking, I'm only talking about revenue loss. No, I'm talking about my colleagues. We were sending them in the field worried whether I hope they don't get infected. If they get infected, their family get infected. Look at the migrants. When they walked, started walking from Mumbai, were they sure of reaching their homes? No. They reached. When we talk about companies, do you think they were sure that they'll be able to revive? No. Because the, uh, there was, if there was one truth, one fact, that was uncertainty, nothing else. So what do you do? In, in a scenario like this, they talk about thriving. I talk about first you survive. You learn to survive. And if you recall how people started finding some work to survive. There was a guy who was running a very nice restaurant in Lucknow. He started sending sanitized uh, veggies. There were people who were, uh, housewives started cooking food and supplying that because they needed money. They needed money for medicines. People were finding ways to get oxygen when there was a shortage. They were finding ways to get admission of their near and dear ones when they were dying. They were, every breath was so important. Today we want to forget it. But no, we can't forget it and we should not forget it. Because this, this what happened, we learned how to survive. Work from home, study from home. They were born out of this uncertainty. Today, I remember talking to some students. Uh, we were doing a type of a survey, All India, and I had about 100 students I used to talk to them. They were students who had the privilege of an exclusive room, a smartphone, no disturbance to attend their classes, and there were children who were sharing one rickety phone with the cooker whistle blowing when the chemistry lecture is on something or the other, but still, still, we did study. We did continue our lives. So technology came and saved us. When we were 
we saw ourselves unsafe outside our four walls, we realized that we have technology and we can work and survive and continue our lives. Today, we don't even want to remember those days. But I think we have learned a lesson which we must remember every day. Because this has also brought us together as a society. Once we survive, then we th th thrive. And thriving is also very, very subjective. For somebody, millions in the bags would be thriving. For somebody, setting up industries will be thriving. For someone like me, bringing out a nice paper, writing a page one story will be thriving. Ask an orphan, he will say, if I get somebody who can take care of me is thriving. A farmer will say, a good crop is thriving. A daily wage earner will say, no, I just need 200 rupees a day, and that's thriving for me. A school student will say, if I can get 90%, I'm thriving. And a mother will say, my children are doing so well, so I'm thriving. She has no plan for herself. So she'll say, oh, my children are doing so well, so I'm thriving. For some, staying together with the family is thriving. For some, spending time, quality time with their children or with their friends or with their family or with the needy will be thriving. But very few will say, oh, I'm thriving because I am happy in a healthy body. How many would say? Till you have a bank balance, nobody says I'm happy and I'm healthy. Thriving does not, in, they did not include these words till we had uh, pandemic. So, you know, I, I'll uh, mention uh, uh, ashram in Varanasi where there are uh, people who want, who are sure of their death in 15 days, go and stay there. Because it's the abode of Shiva. If you die there, you get uh, salvation. So they go and live there for 15 days. They'll say, if I die in 15 days, I'll thrive. Otherwise, they have to leave that ashram because they're not allowed to stay there for more than 15 days. Guys, today, the buzzword across the globe is happiness. Happiness is what people are talking about. The governments world over are focusing on health because everybody has realized that you have to spend some time on your health. And if you are not healthy, you can't be happy. If there is one person sick in your family, you can't be happy. Happiness is again subjective. As they say now, life has its problems. It's full of problems. It has challenges. So either sulk or smile. It's an option before you. Because challenges would be there. I, uh, I, it was not a, uh, you know, uh, it was not a very, very, uh, I had a lot of thrill, but I won't say it was such a, uh, walk, uh, safe walk in my journey. There were so many highs and lows. That happens in everybody's life. Because when you know that life is full of challenges and death is something real, so it is the time between your life and death that you can work on. So before I conclude, I'll say that be happy. You can't say, I can't be happy, I have so many problems. As my friend says, when he's caught in a traffic jam, he says, I listen to music. The two options before me is either fume or fret or listen to music. Fuming doesn't help the traffic move. That at least calms me down. Music at least calms me down. So happiness is a state of mind. It's up to you what you want to do. But you can't say, I cannot stay happy because, again, 
The only reason for you to stay happy is that you are alive today. You are alive today. You are listening to people. You are moving around, studying. You are dreaming. You have plans. And you have your prayers. Thank you so much.